Uh, good morning, good afternoon for everyone. Um, I'm Mauro Cristeche. I'm an associate researcher at the National Research Council of Argentina. Uh, I share the same institution with Facundo, and I'm also a lecturer in constitutional law at the University of La Plata in Argentina. Uh, I'm very happy to be sharing this panel with you guys and thank, thanks, thank you, Sam, for all your support and Alice and, and all the people who are uh, joining us this, this meeting. Great, thank you, Mauro. Now, Facundo, uh, take it away. Hi, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, as Mauro said, I am from Argentina. I am have a PhD uh, at philosophy at the University of Buenos Aires. So my my, my presentation would be uh, basically uh, be a, a defense of basic income versus or vis a vis uh, conditional cash samples, especially in Latin America. I work or I research at the CONICET, which is the National Research Center here in Argentina, and I teach philosophy ethics in, in particular in. Um, the Universidad of Buenos Aires. So uh, thanks a lot for being here. And th thanks a lot, Sam and Alice, for the hard work during this, uh, this, uh, these days. And especially a lot of thanks to Timothea, who has sent a lot of emails, super, super useful and super um, important. <laughs> thanks. Absolutely. And Appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. And yes, um, as people will have heard from uh, Timothea and heard her mentioned in uh, other sessions, she's definitely the glue kind of holding us all together uh, for this Congress. Um, so once I've wrapped up this quick introduction, I will hand things over to Mauro to present his session. Um, the last thing I did want to say is that uh, our volunteer team uh, created a mission statement so that we could come uh, summarize what we're trying to achieve with the Congress. And uh, I'd like to share that quickly uh, with you now. So uh, we believe that freedom from poverty and human security uh, should be a basic human right. We believe that basic income is the best met method to make this a living reality. Uh, the time for basic income has come. So we're here to talk about how we make that happen. We can only achieve this through cooperation and through collaboration. Our mission with the Congress was to bring speakers and attendees from all over the world together to make, uh, to take basic income from idea to reality. So uh, without further ado, we hope you enjoy the session and uh, I'll give the floor now to Mauro. Mauro, take it away. Okay, thank you, Sam. I tried to share my humble um, PowerPoint. Uh, I think uh, I, ah, yes. So let's try to do it. Can you see it? Yeah, we can see that. Thanks, Maro. Okay. Perfect. So um, I present some ideas about the emergency responses in Latin America and the Caribbean since the um, the COVID-19 pandemic and, and to try to link them with debates about the universal basic income in the region. My idea with this um, work was um, to try to better understand um, whether what we have seen since the pandemic in terms of the expansion of emergency policies and the role of the state can be considered um, as a background or as an indication that implementing uh, a UBI in the region might be possible in the near future. And I will argue that this process um, has not expressed uh, a sign of willingness to move towards a real UBI in the region. Um, in the paper, I offer uh, a panorama of the socioeconomic problems of Latin America, which I think you are familiarized with, um, and how structural poverty and inequality contrast with a general system of protection of human rights. I won't give you many details about that, but simply remark that, that there is a notorious gap there. 
um, the region experiences um, uh, um, a massive and systematic process of violation of human rights and reproduces itself at expense of a vast part of the population, hundreds of millions of people suffering high levels of precariousness, uh, super exploitation, informality, and um, unemployment. And for sure, the pandemic has exposed and, and increased uh, all these problems. Um, then I analyze uh, the emergency responses, particularly those targeting the informal sectors um, uh, or, or the vulnerable sectors in general, uh, adding a closer look at the Argentinian case, the, the Ingreso Familiar de Emergencia. Uh, and I also analyzed the proposal of an emergency basic income uh, launched by the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, the, the ECLAC, in May 2020. As we all know, uh, since March 2020, um, governments around the region implemented different emergency measures, uh, basically cash transfer policies, but also other, other policies to help millions of people um, who had lost uh, their jobs or their daily income. Uh, and this increasing intervention of the states and more in general, the huge crisis that brought the pandemic um, made many people and experts wondering whether it would impact uh, the social agenda in Latin America and, and whether we were facing an opportunity to fight for a profound transformation that address the, the historical problems of our societies. Um, so it was in this context uh, that debates of UBI an important place in the, in the public agenda. Uh, plus in, in May 2020, as I said before, the, the ECLAC launched, um, ah, my connection is unstable. Are you, are you listening to me well? Yeah, we can we can still hear you, Mauro. At least I can. Um, it, it went a little bit spotty there for a minute, but I think it's okay now. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, so the ECLAC uh, launched this proposal of an emergency basic income uh, based on the diagnosis that uh, it would take a lot of time to to control the pandemic, that uh, there were a definite risk of a dramatic increase in poverty. And that a measure like that um, uh, uh, would contribute somehow to, to the recovery of the economy. The proposal consisted of a monthly benefit equivalent to the minimum wage of each country for a period of at least three months, but ideally six or even 12 months. And it would have benefited um, around 215 million people, around 35% uh, of the regional population. You can see in the graph um, that uh, the different proposal, uh, on average, the cost of, of this uh, EBI varied between a minimum of 1.7% of GDP for a benefit equivalent to a poverty line, around 145% dollars uh, for three months for all person below the line of poverty. And then the maximum was uh, a proposal of equivalent to, to around 10% of GDP for a benefit uh, uh, equivalent to a poverty line for six months for all persons, right? So, so these uh, initiatives caught a lot of attention and, and have also contributed to push uh, forward the, the UBI debate um, uh, in many countries around the region. But what I wanted to see uh, it, it was if all that expect, expectation um, had a real basis, had, had a basis in, in reality. And I think it was uh, worth exploring the emergency policies um, and more in general, the role of the states uh, to shed light uh, on the discussion on, on the possibilities of, of the UBI in the region in the, in, in the near future. Um, so um, analyzing the emergency measures, uh, we see differences among the countries for sure. Uh, in the paper, I, I give the, the examples of Mexico and Brazil, 
uh, analyzed by, by Lustig and, and Transfer, uh, they, they found that both countries saw um, a huge rise in inequality and poverty, uh, but Brazil uh, expanded cash transfers, uh, provided an important income floor for, 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 for the population, and, and its fiscal uh, stimulus was among the highest in the region. On the contrary, the responses uh, in Mexico were among the lowest and leaving most of its people uh, without active um, support, especially the, the informal sectors. Um, but beyond important differences, um, uh, the policies uh, to protect the informal and employed sector have followed, uh, um, uh, I would say, some evident patterns. Right. Uh, on the one hand, its implementation was swift, considering the, the weaknesses of the Latin American economies and, and their social protection system and the difficulties in, in identifying recipients of, of the benefit. The first case uh, of COVID in, reported in Brazil uh, late February 2020. And on March, uh, like two weeks later, um, governments began announcing social protection measures. And between uh, the 13th of March and, and 24th of April, uh, 29 countries uh, had adopted more than or around uh, um, 130 uh, social protection measures uh, to help the, the at this time, these policies have reached uh, a wide coverage, although there, there have been differences um, uh, there have been differences in coverage among uh, sub-regions and among countries, but you can see in the graph in the in the in the, in the, in the graph above uh, um, the coverage of the of the cash transfers. Uh, policies has been very good, uh, nearly 50% of the population as an average. So, but the most important is that we have been very precarious. I'd like to highlight it. Uh, as shown in this graph, um, there was no country where the amounts of cash were the poverty line, and in only a few cases, they were above the extreme poverty line. So, and I have analyzed the in detail, in more detail, the, the emergency family income, the Ingreso Familiar de Emergencia, created by the Argentinian government. And, uh, and if we consider an entire year from April 2020 to April or to March 2021, uh, the benefit was less than $40 monthly uh, to each household. It's a very low benefit with, um, without uh, continuity and predictability. It was paid only three times in an entire year, right? And so beyond its wide coverage, uh, it reached 9 million families, 75% of those who, who applied for the benefit. It, it's a very, very good coverage. Uh, and although it wasn't the only emergency policy implemented, um, this uh, Ingreso Familiar de Emergencia was a very precarious ed. And in fact, the protection uh, of the formal sector was much more intense than that of the vulnerable sector. And this happened not only in Argentina, but um, in most of the Latin American countries. So um, we, of course, we, 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 we have to say that, that these cash transfer policies help to mitigate uh, the negative impact of the, of the crisis on the vulnerable sector without any help for sure, the situation would have been would have been much worse. Um, so you can see the differences in the increase of poverty and extreme poverty in, in the graph uh, with and without the emergency policy. But it, it's evident that, that these policies have been extremely precarious and insufficient to, to halt the increase of poverty and the growth of inequality. 
uh, in fact, the first nine months of, of the pandemic have left uh, 20, 22, 23 million new poor people around Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, and so, so 34% of the, of, the, of the regional population were living in poverty by the end of 2020 and close to 80 million of them were below the extreme poverty line. So suffering hunger. Um, so this means a, a 12 year setback in, in poverty and a 20 year setback in extreme poverty according to, to a clock. And moreover, the, the, the poverty gap has also uh, increased considerably, meaning that millions of people who were already poor have become even poorer being the growth of extreme poverty, a sign of that, right? Uh, in the case of Argentina, poverty um, had already increased uh, from 25% to 35% of the population between um, 2018 and 2019. We were already facing a big uh, economic crisis, but during the pandemic, it reached 42% of the population with almost 60% of children today being poor. Um, so eventually, beyond the, the initial expectations, uh, none of the Latin American countries implemented a cash transfer policy as the one proposed by the, the ECLAC. This um, emergency basic income wasn't a real universal basic income. Uh, but at least it was a strong plan uh, that would have helped to protect people from poverty and to avoid the growth of inequality around the region. Um, here we can see uh, how many more resources would have been needed to implement this proposal for six or 12 months. Um, of course, we all know that, uh, that the region was already uh, suffering an economic crisis before the pandemic and, and that Latin American states uh, are quite weak and, and most of them were facing external debt crisis. And, and, and so we couldn't pretend uh, a response like in European countries. Uh, but in any case, from my point of view, um, the imperative to devote uh, the maximum available resources uh, for the full protection of the vulnerable sector uh, wasn't met at all. And uh, the region spent around 1.7% uh, GDP in emergency cash transfer and, and the vulnerable sector have been comparatively uh, the least helped uh, and who have suffered the most the effect of the, of the pandemic. So um, do I have like, Five minutes more or, or two minutes? Okay, so so I'm 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 finishing. This year the, the ECLAC has insisted with the proposal of um, of an emergency basic income for the region as a transitional measures uh, measure uh, towards the main goal of the ECLAC, the ECLAC, which is a real universal basic income for the new decade within the, the, the framework of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, so again, this made waves throughout the region and, and, and even some countries uh, such as Argentina, Colombia, uh, Mexico and Brazil, um, uh, like uh, it, it came out some debates or, or debates uh, has penetrated uh, the institutional sphere um, uh, or, or even in some countries, for example, in Argentina, some grassroots movement have put the UBI as a central demand in their programs. Um, and from my point of view, um, the UBI seems uh, to be a reasonable response uh, to face the critical situation um, around the region and moreover to address the challenges uh, included in the Agenda 2030 regarding poverty, you know, uh, inequality, gender equality, education, decent work and so on. Um, 
And what is more, it doesn't, it doesn't seem there are many other alternatives alternative to, to address most of the problems that affect the working class and its vulnerable sector in a reasonable, reasonable period of time. Um, uh, but so for many reasons, uh, the UBI appears to be an appropriate policy for Latin America. And I think there's um, for the um, but I think it is clear that the obstacles to make it real appear to be huge and many because the precariousness of the emergency measures during the pandemic are a warning from my point of view are a warning sign that we are not even close to make it a reality. Uh, most of the ongoing proposals are a sort of more extended cash transfer uh, policies with very modest amounts, like generally between a third or a half of the minimum wage, far cry for, from the ideal UBI. That's the case uh, for Argentina, for example. Um, so the region has an extended social protection system uh, around 135 million people um, Latin Americans were receiving uh, a social benefit before the pandemic. So we don't have to start from zero. And, but at the same time, the pandemic has confirmed that these um, welfare policies in quotation marks uh, to protect vulnerable sector are extremely precarious and a, and a radical change is needed in this sphere. Then it is, urgent to address the problem of income distribution. Tax system do not work as an instrument for redistribution in the region and partially explain persistent high inequality. Um, to implement a, a large social protection um, policy such as the UBI, um, a progressive tax reform would be necessary as well as to tackle tax evasion, which is huge in Latin America, around 6% GDP. Uh, since the pandemic, uh, proposal on taxing um, the richest people uh, appear to be, to be widely accepted uh, among the, the Latin American population. Argentina uh, was the first country in the region to apply an extraordinary um, uh, wealth tax uh, during the pandemic and strictly speaking was the only country because uh, in the case of Bolivia, it was a, a voluntary contribution uh, that didn't result in, 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 in any significant revenue collection. Um, but also in, 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 in our country, in, in Argentina, considering the support of the population and the fiscal urgencies, the Argentinian government, at least from, from my point of view, uh, missed an opportunity to impose a more ambitious wealth tax. Um, and beyond the potential of exceptional uh, measures to implement a UBI, it would be necessary to produce a radical tax reform, not only a transitional um, wealth tax. Um, so, and, and the ongoing uh, tax structure tell us uh, uh, about both the power of elite in Latin America and, and the economic interest, interests that governments uh, tend to protect, right? Um, and we also uh, must reflect on how such a proposal fits into a sustainable development pathway, right? It is even worth asking whether an UBI is compatible with the logic of capital accumulation, especially in a region like Latin America, because the structural problems of Latin America are not limited to redistribution of wealth, uh, but, but uh, they reach the entire production process, extractivism, overexploitation, destruction of labor force and, and natural resources and, and so on. So, in summary, <laughs> even though the pandemic um, engulfed 
the role of the state and the expansion of emergency policies, the debate of, on, the, on the universal basic income, uh, not very frequent uh, until then, gained space in some countries, in the region, in the public agenda, in mass media, in academia, right? Um, but we, what we have seen is emergency policies that have reproduced the patterns already seen in the region, very low income. Um, as in the rest of Latin America, the, 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 the ingreso familiar de emergencia in Argentina was far from the EBI proposed by the ECLAT, the ECLAT and much further from, from what a real UBI would be. Uh, so from my point of view, as Latin American states are weak with limited resources, a clear change of priorities would have been essential but didn't occur. Even if in the Argentinian case, we had an extraordinary wealth, right? I think this, this crisis has so far not uh, meant an opportunity to question the dynamics of capital accumulation in the region and a change of priorities. On the contrary, these dynamics, uh, um, which, reproduces super exploitation, poverty and inequality seems to have reaffirmed itself. Um, so until now, uh, the, the, the SDGs seem to be much more wishful thinking than real goals to be achieved. Well, thank you for, for listening and, and feel free to, to ask any question. I try to. Thank you so much, Mero. So while um, I'm gonna ask Alice just to put on um, Facundo's um, presentation just now. To... Um, and oh, so uh, stop share. Okay. Perfect. Um, thank you. Just while she does that, I'll, I'll give you another clap emoji as well. So thank you so much, Maru. I think um, there's lots of deep questions there about the the unsuitability, if we call it that, of capitalism uh, as we are, especially in Latin, at Latin America, as you're alluding to, and yeah, about the the SDGs being wishful thinking in a lot of cases. Um, so I think that'll bring some great questions to the mind of people listening. So I'll ask again, um, if you do have any questions, please pop them in the uh, the chat on Hoover, um, or when we move to the Q and A, um, could let you um, put on your put in your mic as well. Okay, Alice, are you able to? Yeah, uh, I can see that now. If we're all yeah, ready, all ready to go. Thank you very much. Okay, perfect. Okay, can you all hear me? Yeah, we can hear that, Alice. Okay, I'll start playing. Suppose that you have a dog. She asks you one and again to have a puppy. You decide that it's a good idea. Then you go to the pet shop and get a puppy for your daughter. When you arrive at your home, your daughter is super happy and rapidly names it Hercules. Now you have two options. The first option is to give her the talk that Hercules is a living and sentient being, that it needs care, bath, taking walks, and that she has to clean any mess that Hercules will certainly do. The second option is to give her the talk and besides to tell her that if she does not fulfill her duties towards Hercules, you will retire her allowance. In the first option, you consider that the information of the talk would be sufficient to comply with her duties. You are trusting her. In the second option, you consider that the given information would not be enough and that you have to add likely threats and sanctions. 
In this case, in this second option, you are distrusting your daughter as a good pet caretaker. Of course, you will have some reasons for distrusting your daughter as a good pet caretaker. If, for example, she has forgotten in the past to feed the birds, the hamster, the cat, etc. But if you do not have those reasons, distrusting her would be an unwarranted attitude based on your stereotypes and biases. Although I know that the analogy is not perfect, I will claim in this presentation that, that basic income is preferable to conditional cash transfers because it's non-distrusting character. In the sense, basic income is analogous to first option and conditional cash transfers are analogous to the second option. This character, as I will show in the presentation, has more legal evidence, at least in Latin American conditional cash transfers, does not insult individuals by building arbitrary rankings of trustworthiness, and besides, does express the due respect associated to membership. Let me first introduce two basic definitions of descriptions. First, regarding conditional cash transfers. As you know, poor households receive a monthly cash transfer if and only if they send their children to schools and the children assist to regular health checks and are vaccinated. Especially this is the case pre-pandemic. We will talk about this yeah. in the future, uh, in the next slides. And at least in Latin America, a priority is attached to the mother. That is, that the mother is the primary recipient of the transfer in name of the gene, of their gene. And the second definition that I will want to offer is a working definition of distrust. I don't know if it is the better, but it's a definition that I like and that I think that it's useful for this purpose. So the idea is that distrust is a, re is a three part type uh, relation where A is just B regarding C, and it can be defined as an attitude based and mediated by the general expe expectation that if the opportunity presents itself, the other party will try to take advantage of a given situation by exploiting our vulnerability. So in this sense, trust and distrust is about taking risk about the actions of the others. And in that taking risk, of course, we are vulnerable, vulnerable to the decisions and actions of the others. Now let's see the risk profiles involved in each scheme of income support. Due to its unconditionality, basic income dissociates the cash transfer from the satisfaction of duties towards the well-being of the children. Since this, it does not assume a lack of motivation or myopia in its recipient. In contrast, conditional cash transfers assume a flawed motivation into its recipients that needs to be countered with conditionalization or has to be protected from perverse, uh, perverse incentives. In short, the idea is that the income increase will not be sufficient to fulfill the duties revolving their children. In this sense, conditional cash transfers assume that beneficiaries are indolent mothers, indifferent to their care duties, unless heavily incentivized or threat with the punishment, that is, the suspension of the transfer. Now, returning to our initial case, conditional cash transfers adopt the position of the parent that reduces risk to Hercules' well being by threatening, surveilling, and eventually punishing. Now, 
as, as we now, now as we said earlier, this distressing could be a reasonable attitude if you will interact with untrustworthy people. It would be unreasonable to give fair and fourth chances to people who systematically let you down. Since this, the next question is this. Are Latin American beneficiaries of conditional gastronomers untrustworthy? Do they deserve the distrust expressed by this kind of income support policies? Do they comply with their health duties of care because their economic cost has been covered by the transfer? Or do they comply with their health duties just because they want to keep her money? The empirical response to this is extremely difficult because conditional cash transfers create a black box where the conditional causal Sorry, Alice, I think you've been accidentally muted there. That seems the, to me the more provocative. The Ecuadorian conditional concern for Bono de Sabros Humano was initially, initially classified as a standard conditional concern. However, conditionalities were never controlled and transfer were cashed despite this. Some beneficiaries were aware of the changes, but many continue to believe that it was conditional. In an interesting paper, Shady and Araujo take advantage of this anomaly and compare the rate of school enrollment across the two groups. That is the groups that were aware of the conditionality and the groups that was not aware of the conditionality. They found that enrollment had increased between six and 8% among those who believed the benefit was conditional. Similar results are found in the initial stages of, for example, the, the Mexican Progresa, which is the Mexican conditional cash standard. These studies are ideal for defenders of the conditionality model. The likelihood of investing in children's human capital increases marginally when conditionality is present and clear. However, the same results can be examined from a different perspective. If the condition Conditionality effect has such a crucial casual role and value. Should not the difference between those who are aware of the conditionality and those who are not aware of the conditionality be more pronounced? It's completely irrelevant that the large majority of those who are unaware of conditionality nevertheless fulfill their duties of care. However, the important question that follows from this is this. Why is it is important not to be unwarrantedly distrusted by your political community? Cannot this expressive harm be compensated by other psychological benefits of receiving the cash transfers, like self-confidence, taking more decisions in the household or reducing the uncertainty of the economic situation. When someone is distrusted, he's been insulted. Regardless of her actions or motives, he's been confronted with negative images that the distractor projects. Images that reduce opportunities for cooperations and for proving one's and for proving one's trustworthiness. In the case of conditional cash transfers, the beneficiaries are distrusted, and as we have seen, are distrusted unwarrantedly, and, and there, there also exists a large asymmetry of power between distrusted and distrusted ones. In this case, marginalization is added to the insult. The distrusted person is, is, is excluded from the community of trustworthy individuals, lose their status, and are made to feel inferior. By contrast, 
the remaining members of the community, the trustworthy members of that community, cannot, without being subject to oversight, and obtain from that a sense of self-worth. This is particularly clear in the political economy argument uh, in favor of conditional examples, which is uh, widely used. Uh, according to this argument, the middle and upper classes oppose unconditional transfers because they consider them unmerited gifts. Even if what it is stake for these upper and middle classes is not of, of significance for them, they can oppose more strongly. Furthermore, since attitudes of distrust tend to be more stable, contagious, and self-fulfilling, they result in the reluctance to carry out cooperative activities with conditional cash transfers beneficiaries. These beneficiaries can meet the conditionalities for more than a decade without any relaxation in the uh, oversight or in the conditionalities. Not only that, but suspicions mined from these middle and upper classes are confirmed thanks to the distrust of intrinsic eagerness to interpret any failure on the part of the distracted as, as confirmation of their preconceived notions, that is, of their stereotypes. For example, frontline officials such as doctors and teachers hastily interpret any failure in the compliance with conditionality as a corroboration of the user suspect narrative and behave toward this, these individuals in a harsh and paternalistic manner. By contrast, Basic income would not make this offense. When schooling and vaccination are mandatory in Latin America, basic income does not believe that the reasons and incentives are different in the case of poor persons or poor citizens and non poor citizens. Basic income, for example, would explore other options to ameliorate the right of compliance, such as promotional and no punitive conditionalities, which are applied to everyone, not just to the beneficiaries, as well as other administrative measures, which uh, only target parents and not put in danger the rights of the kids to uh, get the benefit of, of the term. In some basic income is preferable because it is more inclusive, less prone to stereotype and biases, and because it creates more opportunities to prove oneself as worth, and creates more opportunities for your daughter to prove herself to be as worth. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, Facundo. Um, thank you both, really. So um, I'll make sure we stop the recording at this point before we move into the Q&A.